Good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark. I am director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at uh, Northeastern University. We are a part of the School of uh, Public Policy and uh, Urban Affairs. And uh, we are picking up where we left off last week uh, with a series of presentations on the uh, impact of design on public policy. Uh, this is the open classroom, um, and uh, we uh, love to focus on policy matters. And this semester, we have the opportunity to uh, work with Anne-Marie Lubenow of the Brunner Foundation. Um, the foundation has worked for a decade to uh, provide awards to uh, distinguished and very distinctive uh, American design efforts to engage community and to improve the quality of life in their communities. And so we welcome you back to these conversations. If you have questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will uh, also uh, be watching the chat box if you have uh, comments that you would like to make. Uh, this session is being recorded and um, has uh, uh, been archived or will be archived along with um, our other uh, presentations. And you should be able to see uh, the archived version of this within uh, a day or two after tonight's presentation. Um, we uh, have rules of civility here. We um, ask that uh, you um, uh, direct your comments uh, at us uh, in a way where we can uh, repeat your questions fully uh, on air, and uh, we hope that you'll join in the dialogue around tonight's very, very fascinating presentation. And with that, um, I'll turn the screen over to my colleague, Anne-Marie Lubenow. Anne-Marie, you're on. Thank you, Ted. Good evening, everybody. I'm Anne-Marie Lubenow, and I'm the director of the Ruby Bruner Award for Urban Excellence at the Bruner Foundation. As Ted mentioned, we're a national urban design award that recognizes transformative places that contribute to the economic, environmental, and social vitality of American cities. And over the course of the spring 2021 Myra Craft Open Classroom, we'll be tapping into our network of 88 award-winning places to explore how cities across America are addressing today's challenges, including socioeconomic equity, racial justice, and resilience through design. Tonight's session will explore the role of food in building communities. We'll travel to Chicago to learn how a series of food-related initiatives on the city's west side are creating jobs, improving public health, and strengthening communities. These include 2013 Rudy Bruner Award Gold Medalist Inspiration Kitchens, a restaurant offering healthy and affordable meals and food service training. We'll also hear about how this project and others became the foundation of an ambitious vision to establish Chicago's first food innovation district. Tonight's presenters include Larry Kearns, a principal with Wheeler Kearns Architects in Chicago, the firm that designed Inspiration Kitchens. As an architect, Larry pursues projects with ambitious social, economic, and environmental goals. In 2008, Larry was named Chicagoan of the Year in Architecture by the Chicago Tribune in recognition of his contributions to the city. Brenda Palms Barber is president and CEO of the North Lawndale Employment Network, an urban workforce development agency in Chicago. She's also the founder of Sweet Beginnings, a social enterprise using urban beekeeping to create jobs for those with significant employment barriers. And joining us as a respondent is Christopher Basso, Associate Director of Academic Affairs at Northeastern University School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. His areas of interest include food and environmental policy, and he's the editor of Feeding Cities, Improving Local Food Access, Sustainability, and Resilience. So now I'll turn this over to Larry and Brenda. Great. Uh, I will then share my screen. Okay, uh, I take it everybody can see that first image. Uh, so with that, um, uh, this is actually 
uh, a project a photograph of a project that I'm not going to talk about tonight. Uh, um, because this is a, a, a food pantry, uh, one that we have done a series of food pantries throughout Chicago. Um, but I, we want to uh, frame the uh, idea of a food district is that much like the US government right now is uh, providing a stimulus bill um, uh, to the country, it's really a relief, right? It's uh, responding to a crisis and helping people achieve stability. Um, the projects that we're going to talk about tonight have a generative uh, impact, right? They're, they're growing something, uh, whether that's uh, human capital, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, you could say financial capital, the economy, uh, or in some sort of environmental capital, right? So uh, clearly, in our, in our view, this idea of a food innovation district has to address this people, planet, and profit in some way. Um, there are a couple unique things about a food uh, innovation district um, in that it, it, it really works when it's a confined uh, area uh, geographically, right? That there is some idea, you know, you hear a lot about the sense of place and you get this idea with a sense of place by this congregation um, uh, of uh, concentration uh, about a certain topic, right? And and food can be one of those uh, one of those unifying factors, right? That that um, cuts across all socioeconomic boundaries, right? So when we say food in innovation district, we also say that it is a place where you grow, process, prepare, and consume the food in a confined area, and that uh, this has uh, also uh, an emphasis on uh, locally produced food, right? The more local, uh, the better, uh, because all of those dollars stay circulating in, uh, in, the, in the local economy. So if you will, that red uh, star, uh, the magenta star at the top of the project is actually that food pantry uh, project that I opened with uh, that photograph of. But if you look at this, uh, this rectangle, this is the area we're gonna be focusing on. We're gonna focus on four projects, one of which Brenda um, is uh, authoring uh, on the west side of Chicago. So uh, this area is about uh, say two to three miles from the center of the city. And on this image, this is uh, known, these are neighborhoods of Chicago on the west side known uh, as Garfield Park and North Lawndale. Um, they're uh, bifurcated by the expressway you see on your, uh, on the screen right now that was built in the early 60s by virtue of the Eisenhower administration. Um, you'll see four uh, numbers on these. These are lo the location of the four projects we're gonna dig down and look at. Um, the first uh, being uh, the Inspiration Kitchens project where I, uh, first uh, met Anne-Marie uh, as, as part of the Rudy uh, Bruner Award. Uh, the number three project is uh, Brenda's project that's located in North Lawndale. Um, the second project uh, is uh, a food processing facility known as the Hatchery. And then the fourth project, which is by far the largest, uh, is also in North Lawndale. And that is a large scale uh, growing facility that we had proposed for the city of Chicago. To give you a sense of scale, I put the one mile marker there on, uh, on the map. Uh, the farthest distance between any of these two projects is about a mile and a half. So it's fairly uh, confined. Um, the other thing uh, I, I did is to just understand where we are data-wise here with the projects, how they differ in terms of their cost per square foot, which is typically a metric that architects use uh, to evaluate the relative costs of their buildings. Um, so that's on the y-axis here. And then on the x-axis is the size of the project. And uh, since our screens aren't seven times as wide, uh, I've cut off part of this because our fourth project, which is the aspirational one, 
is so much larger than the others. So again, the first project here is um, a project that uh, Anne-Marie already mentioned, that's Inspiration Kitchens. And that's a, uh, I also express these in 2021 dollars. Uh, so that's a $2.2 million project. Number three, which is Brenda's project. I have included a partner project with this because uh, Brenda has a local bank called Wintrust Bank as a, as a, as a key partner in this project. Um, so total project cost of say 5.7 million there. Both those projects hover around the $300 per square foot mark. The second project, which is the, uh, the hatchery, that's a business incubator aimed at food. That's considerably more expensive uh, given all the kitchen equipment. Uh, again, in present day dollars, uh, that being a $38 million project. And then way off to the right, uh, the $56 million project. But however, it's covering so much territory with uh, Dutch style uh, greenhouses that its cost per square foot is relatively uh, low, uh, somewhere around uh, $40 a square foot. So now uh, I will walk you through each of these four projects um, and then taking a break at the beginning of Brenda's project uh, so that she can speak to the mission and the purpose of that better than I could. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on the Inspiration Kitchens project because Rudy Bruner has so thoroughly documented it. I should also say that uh, you can gain a great depth of knowledge about the project by accessing the website and drilling down on lots and lots of detail here. Uh, but this is a, a bird's eye view of uh, that area where you saw the number one on the map. And uh, at the top of the photograph, is uh, Garfield Park. And you'll see the L line uh, running right there. So your T, we call it the L in Chicago, uh, is uh, bordering that park. And it actually borders our project. Um, this is an adaptive reuse of a 1900 building that was built for the tool and die factory as a tool and die factory. Here's another view spun around with North being up and that magenta square being our project. Um, this is very close to the Garfield Park Conservatory, which, which is a, a well-loved uh, project from the early, uh, early 1900s. In fact, the conservatory was built at the same time this industrial building that we, that we redo, reused was built in the first decade of the 1900s. Uh, and then again, you see the L uh, running through. This is uh, looking down on the project uh, and you will going from left to right. There's a little garden here and we should say it's a small garden but meant to be more of a demonstration garden. Um, it has really uh, created a series of community gardens. It was seminal in that way and that there are two or three other copycat gardens within a stone's throw from this site. And we'll see a photograph of that, a small parking area to the right of that. And then the building itself, which um, we did not do in addition to this building, we merely revived some of the technology uh, stemming from the early 1900s. Uh, these sawtooth skylights that were on top of the buildings to eliminate, illuminate uh, an industrial work floor now we use to illuminate the inside. This project in terms of people, planet and profit um, the planet, uh, this actually has renewable energy on uh, the roof, uh, this in the, in the form of solar thermal collectors, given the uh, very uh, high appetite for hot water that uh, a food uh, processing and, uh, pr preparation facility has. Um, this is a plan view. Uh, uh, um, this incorporates uh, to the lower left-hand corner an 80 seat uh, restaurant. So to explain Inspiration Kitchens, um, Inspiration uh, Corporation was started by a Chicago policewoman who towed a red wagon around her beat uh, with uh, uh, brown bag lunches she would hand out to the homeless. Um, and her organization started formalizing later joined uh, with a workforce organization 
to really become the Inspiration uh, Kitchens uh, and Inspiration Corporation we know today. So uh, their mission really is to use uh, the food service industry as a way within 13 weeks to take somebody from unemployment or underemployment uh, into, a, into the workforce. And of course, with all the wraparound services, uh, social services uh, required there and all the, the necessary supports. So uh, um, this uh, off to the right-hand side is a uh, is a actually a commercial kitchen size to also uh, be a teaching kitchen uh, where you can have cohorts of up to 15, 16 people uh, learning uh, proper skills to get employment within Chicago's uh, food industry. Uh, the, the, the small uh, vignettes off to the right are a small basement and then a, then a loft space. This might give you a better idea. This is if we saw the building and the L across the street in half and look down upon it, where you can see uh, the garden in the distance, the parking lot, and then the building itself with those two weird shaped triangular sawtooth skylights, right? Which were uh, just uh, specifically utilitarian in the early 1900s and still utilitarian for us, letting in daylight into the interior and then using their opaque sides to collect uh, the solar energy from the sun, which provides ample hot water, even in uh, the middle of a Chicago winter like now. Uh, you can see the restaurant uh, close, uh, closest to the L. So this is a view of the finished project looking under the L. And the thing I want to stress with this photograph is that a lot of well-intentioned uh, philanthropists um, end up uh, donating and building what I call UFOs that land in Chicago neighborhoods. Um, and this is not unique to Chicago, but uh, is a phenomenon we've seen elsewhere in the country where you'll actually have a very generous donation go on, if not underutilized, unwelcomed in a way, uh, because it is not, um, should I say, uh, woven into the into the neighborhood. Uh, Inspiration Kitchens, because of their background here, uh, collaborated with many many uh, community organizations before they even put a shovel in the ground on this project um, to develop relationships, understand the needs of the community so that they could respond. And as architects, we very purposefully did not alter, uh, but really just embellish the appearance of this building. We wanted the building to be as unassuming in a way as it ever had been, just an accepted part of the, of, of the community, but one that was quickly uh, and creatively reanimated. So this is the view of that uh, dining room. Um, the important things here to note are just keeping all of the artifacts of the old industrial interior. So all the, the ceilings here and the columns are uh, original to the building. You can see through some of that beamwork, the, the, the northern light coming into the, into the space. As a social place, it's very important uh, for us to put ourselves in the shoes of the first person to walk in here in a morning or say in a lunch, right? And say, what does that feel like to enter this space? And the purpose of the open kitchen is very much uh, so that as I walk in, I'm never alone, right? I always have somebody to greet me and it's always has this idea of this, uh, this place being a social hub. The other thing about uh, Inspiration Kitchens is there is no tipping here. Um, the staff and the trainees uh, serve you, but all of the tips, the so-called pay up um, uh, sort of policy of the restaurant, all of that money goes back into the program. And over 300 uh, free meals are served by um, uh, Inspiration Kitchens to those surrounding community organizations distributed through them, but in a, in a very discreet uh, voucher program that uh, no one in the restaurant can distinguish who is a paying customer or not. So this is very much part of the, the social mission and part of uh, one not-for-profit building the capacity of another. 
Um, the other important thing to note as we look at this photograph is that this facility will be baking uh, uh, goods for Brenda to sell in North Lawndale at her facility, right? So this idea of collaboration is part of a food innovation district where you have lots of not-for-profits collaborating with one another to build capacity. This is a view of the training kitchen. And this is another thing I wanna point out to you, spaces that otherwise go unseen in, um, in affluent areas uh, are now put on display, right? Not only for the dignity of work, but to put on display the opportunity, literally on the sidewalk in this case. We've had many people comment to us, well, this is rather cruel because this is the nicest kitchen you will ever work in, right? Overlooking a, a large park, right? Um, uh, uh, bathed in daylight. But part of this is actually making this accessible to anybody walking on the sidewalk. And this has proved extremely successful with people taking note of the opportunity here just because it's exposed on the sidewalk. This is that garden uh, that uh, has gone through many different iterations. This, I, in some ways, is the most surprising part of the project. When you talk about a community, there's an incredible amount of diversity. And with one or two years, there were high density polyculture ways of growing here uh, that were imported from Western Africa. Um, and those were replicated elsewhere um, in East Garfield Park. And this garden has only grown more diverse, more complex, and more connected uh, to, its, uh, to its environment. It, it never was a place, right, that could grow uh, enough food to feed people um, that are served in the restaurant, but it has grown uh, much more in its impact uh, and awareness um, throughout the community. And of course, uh, a large part of any job uh, program is all the, the social wraparound services uh, and then access uh, to communication, to contact employers, develop resumes and so on. And that you'll see reflected also in Brenda's mission uh, later. This uh, second project uh, I'm gonna talk about, and I should also say that Inspiration now has placed over 650 individuals in jobs in the past decade. So just to give you some idea, the restaurant is currently closed for COVID, but even they have gone to a six week uh, virtual program to have their students uh, continue to get opportunities. So number two on this uh, map is a project that we did not actually get the commission. We competed um, enthusiastically for the commission, but it, ultimately the project went to a design builder, meaning us a company that actually constructs the project and also designs it. But uh, it's still a relevant part of uh, this food district. And it is a project that we want to shake hands with in many ways with our other um, food projects in, in this district. So this is a, a business incubator around uh, food businesses. This is a very early sketch we did of, of, of a diagram, um, which you'll see we describe later as a head and tail. Uh, where you have a communal social hub, so to speak, at the head of the facility, and then a tail, which is a repetitive kitchens, uh, one after another, uh, in which small businesses can rent and grow. So this is the scale. You'll see it's right down the L, uh, just a little over a half a mile away from uh, Inspiration Kitchens. This is a diagram we did when we were uh, conceptualizing the project for our own sake and sharing this with the owners. The originators of this project are a combination of an incubator and, uh, that actually already existed in the West Loop of Chicago who started having success with food programs. And I don't know if Logan Airport has Farmer's Fridge, but this is a sort of a salad vending machine, if you will. That, that was one of their early um, uh, incubated companies that has gone on to great success. Um, so they wanted to grow that. The other partner here, when we look again, People, Planet and Profit is uh, Chicago's largest micro lender called Axiom. So you'll see this sort of head and tail arrangement 
where you have this social hub, the forum, admin, uh, some shared food science and test kitchen areas that uh, the that the companies the, that are being incubated here could use. There are 54 kitchens here that can be rented on a monthly basis. Um, and the shared resources uh, beyond the sort of intellectual capital here and the access to, to financial capital is this idea of having combined loading dock, being able to share all of the, you know, cooperatively share the costs of cold and dry storage, which again gets very expensive if you're not operating at scale. So early on in this project, uh, when we were proposing on it, we had thought about the necessity uh, to be able to have kitchens readily configurable, reconfigurable, whether you are a baker and then you're going to say producing a protein product, whether you are a beverage maker, right? You'd have to accommodate all these different types of kitchens and have to rearrange them constantly, right? So as a, as a tenant space. So this was an early idea we had about providing a crawl space below and, a, and seal, an accessible ceiling above so that you could make these transitions effortlessly and switch from one, uh, one uh, company to another. So again, this is a project we did not do. So this is White and Company Design Builders. This is their project, but is the, is the culmination that very much followed the sort of head and tail diagram that we originally proposed. So again, 54 kitchens, uh, their target is to incubate 75 companies a year uh, in, this, in this facility um, and uh, targeting the creation of 150 jobs a year. So again, in present day dollars, we estimate this to be 38 million. Uh, and this is 67,000 square feet, right? Uh, but twice as expensive as the other projects, right? Just because of the intensity of, of uh, labor and trade work involved in, in, in outfitting a commercial kitchen. So this is one view uh, taken from uh, White & Company's uh, website, just of that shared kitchen. I have attended programs here um, and been in this shared kitchen. So if you were in the very early stages, you can actually rent a part of this shared kitchen on an hourly basis. Uh, so now uh, we're gonna look at the, the, the third project here, which is Brenda. Then Brenda, if you could take it away, uh, explaining your mission and uh, when you would like me to move to the next slide, please just give me a cue. Will do, thank you. Great, and, um, and Brenda, before, yes. before you start, we had uh, a couple of um, questions. technical questions that came up, particularly around the, the first project. Um, one was uh, whether the cost per square foot um, was for the land only or the structure only or the land uh, and the structure. Okay, very good question. Uh, uh, that is a construction cost only. So it excludes all of the soft costs uh, and the cost of the land. And, and concerning the land, were the uh, soils tested uh, beforehand? Did you use the soil that was there um, or uh, were the plantings that we saw uh, established in separate boxes? Okay. All right, somebody knows their urban ecology. So um, they're, uh, okay, so in terms of the environmental testing on the site, because it was uh, an industrial location and they had used industrial lubricants, there is one part of the basement that we had to remediate where we actually had to remove a quantity of soil and then to encapsulate it. Um, on the question of uh, growing, we do have a separation between the growing, growing soil and all of the soil beneath it. Um, because Chicago, like Boston, is an urban area where you had leaded gasoline, uh, cars operating on leaded gasoline for so long, it's almost impossible to find any uh, ground uh, that is suitable for growing food in. Um, so for this reason, we followed the, the uh, solution in many urban farms in Chicago and provide a separation layer and uh, new soil, uh, clean soil 
um, for the food to grow in that's placed atop and, that barrel. And, and who actually owns the land? Actually, uh, Inspiration Kitchens, uh, Inspiration Corporation owns the land. So, um, and that is going to be the case with uh, Brenda's project as well. Uh, it is the case uh, also in the hatchery where the land is uh, held by the, uh, the organizations themselves. So um, as far as I know, the city of Chicago on most of their uh, redevelopment agreements that we've been involved with over the last 35 years or so, um, usually end up uh, uh, absolutely selling the land uh, with stipulations for the redevelopment. Um, specifically um, on the hatchery that was city owned land uh, for inspiration kitchens, it was actually privately owned land. Um, and then when I think about Brenda, Brenda's uh, project is also was also on privately owned land. So in the, out of the, um, four projects we're sharing with you tonight, two were owned by the city, the land, and two were privately owned. And um, after that first project was completed, um, has it become uh, operationally self-sustaining or uh, is there a, a continuing need for uh, contributions? Uh, uh, there is not a need for contributions because the money uh, that was raised for that project along with the major donor uh, had a lot of foresight um, in the way that we spent less than half, uh, maybe a third of the total budget raised for the project on the building itself. This is something wise owners, uh, not-for-profits do, um, endowing their project with sustainability from the get-go and not spending uh, needlessly on the bricks and mortar, uh, but on ensuring that their programs will continue. So uh, I have remained connected to uh, Inspiration ever since we did this project and continue to follow them and talk with them all the time. Uh, and this project continues to thrive um, without additional donations. Well, that's terrific. Um, we have a number of, of questions that are coming in and I remind folks that uh, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box uh, at uh, the bottom of uh, your screen. Um, I'd love to hear from Brenda and then we will uh, get back to uh, more questions about uh, the first project and about her project. So Brenda, you're on. Thank you, Ted. Uh, I'll just add that the food, we didn't talk about the food at Inspiration Kitchen, and it is so good. Um, fresh salads and freshly made dressings, and they have a chicken sandwich, and don't, 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 don't laugh at me, but uh, <laughs> there's a chicken sandwich that's out of this world. So um, I think that's really important around their sustainability, that people love to go there because it's a beautiful place to to dine and to connect, but the food is also really great. Um, the gentleman that you see on the screen, is his name is Kelvin Greenwood. And I learned so much from Kelvin. The North Lawndale neighborhood is a community that has been deeply impacted by all the social ills um, brought on through poverty. So we do have high crime rates and, um, you know, high incarceration rates, high unemployment rates, unfortunately, all of those uh, challenges, but it's also a beautiful, wonderful network of people who um, historically are very proud of the role that this community has played in civil rights. Um, and the beautiful boulevards that we have, it's, it's a really, um, at its core, a beautiful place. But you can see in this picture um, behind Kelvin, is an alleyway to a major highway. And unfortunately, the building that you see with the two red doors was actually a very active um, crack house um, where people would go and get high. There's a gas station to the far left that you can't see that was one of the, it's one of the highest um, drug trafficked areas in the, in, the, in the neighborhood, really on the west side. And then you see Kelvin standing in the backyard of our very small little building that we started out in with a bunch of, um, in, a, in an apiary, a bee farm. And uh, like many people looking for work, Kelvin spent eight years behind bars, 
uh, he had a temper. Um, it was, uh, he happened to have a gun. Um, there was the person that uh, he got into an altercation with um, survived, but he did have to serve his time. So he did serve his time. He was from the south side of the city, from Inglewood, and um, found our program because there aren't a whole lot like Sweet Beginnings where folks who need to get some work experience before they can be competitive in the labor market uh, need an opportunity to gain those skills. And that's really what Sweet Beginnings does is we help take the sting, okay, get ready, out of reentry. There will be a few of those. <laughs> so, um, but he's a beautiful person. And what I learned from Kelvin was um, my first interview with him. And I just said, well, tell me about your work experience, Kelvin. What, what kind of work experience do you have? And he said, well, ma'am, I, I don't have any work experience. And I said, well, what, what did you do that got you in trouble and uh, that you had to serve time for? And he said, well, ma'am, you know, I, I, was, I was a drug dealer in addition to this crime that he had with a gun. And I said, well, hmm, well, were you a good drug dealer? And he said, well, yes, ma'am, I was. And he went on to tell me that you know, he had to be so organized that it's very competitive on the block that he had to manage his inventory. And he went on and I just said, you know, Kelvin, never say that you don't have work experience because you have terrific work experience. It was illegal, but it was great work experience. And we need to figure out how to transform those skills into something that you can use legally. And so Kelvin was someone that I really learned a lot from and continues to be a very good friend of mine. Today, he's married, he has a son, and uh, he works at the Ford Motor Company on the south side of Chicago. Next slide, thanks. So the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. Um, there are currently you know, about 2.1 million people living behind bars. And what, what I think we forget as a society is that we can't just lock folk up and then realize and, and think that we've solved the problem. 90% of the people that we lock up will be released. And so in the state of Illinois, we roughly release about 40,000 people annually. And we've learned that 10,000 of those individuals come to the west side of Chicago. 57% of the residents in our community have been justice involved, which is a stunning number. And then our poverty rate, of course, is 48% or two times higher than the city of Chicago. And I did mention that our unemployment rate is 27% or three times higher than that of the city of Chicago. Next slide, please. So honey and reentry are sticky. <laughs> it's a crazy combination. But in fact, we knew that we had to create a way that men and women who had served their time for their crimes could successfully reintegrate back into society. And a huge role that em and employment rather is a, plays a huge role in that. And so that was the challenge. No one wanted to hire these folks um, when we first started this business uh, back in 2004, 2005. And so um, after going through our job training programs, you know, there wasn't anywhere for these folks to work. So it was clear that we had to create our own business that would allow men and women who have served their time to gain work experience, people like Kelvin. And so people say, well, how, how, how did you land on bees? And I honestly wish that there was a better story, but let me tell you that uh, I was at my wits end and we had considered a lot of very, very, very bad ideas. And eventually we landed on honeybees because we were so desperate to do something. And, and I'll tell you, I met with beekeepers and the beekeepers that I met with um, shared with me how people learn about beekeeping. And it's through storytelling people. And I thought, yes, that resonated because so many of the folks that we work with haven't necessarily been successful academically, but we all love storytelling. And so I thought we can make this work. And so we convinced the Illinois Department of Corrections to give us a seed grant to help launch a honeybee business that was specifically hire men and women with criminal records. 
So it's it has been a sticky situation, but I'm happy to say that we're 16 years um, operating the business and that we've had over 500 men and women that have been hired through our Sweet Beginning Social Enterprise. And what's most important is that the rate of recidivism or the number of people that have returned to prison have been less than 10%. And on, just so you have some perspective, on average in the state of Illinois, it's roughly about 55 to 65% who return to prison within three years. And that's not the case for us. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give you a picture of our products. We produce beautiful local urban honey throughout the city of Chicago. We're distributed in 44 um, Kroger stores under the name of Mariano's. We also are uh, have a wonderful online and thriving um, e-commerce business that's going well. And this is a picture of our shower gel. We have lotions, body creams, and lip balm. And all I'm saying is there's another brand out there that you're probably very familiar with. All I'll say is that we actually have honey in our lip balm. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next, uh, next slide, please. Um, second chances matter. And the young lady you see in this picture, her name is Charlotte. Charlotte today is one of our team leaders for Sweet Beginnings. Um, she has a very difficult background. It's been hard for her to find employment. But now that she's worked for us for at least two years, it's gonna make it easier for us to place her with employment because she's established such a positive work history with us. Next slide. So here's what's beautiful. Um, what, I, what I've learned over the years is that because North Lawndale is a community that's so deeply impacted by poverty, people tend to think of the dark side of our community and all those negative social ills. And so when I say to folks, well, we are operating, you know, an urban bee farm, you know, an apiary uh, in North Lawndale, people will say, well, well, where do the bees go? Because they can't imagine that there are flowers in North Lawndale, <laughs> you know? And I love sort of changing the narrative for folk and saying, no, there are beautiful flowers. There are people that have gardens and, and actually what I've also learned is that honeybees don't discern between what we see as weeds or flowers. They're only interested in drawing the good out of that plant source and transforming it into something that is sweet and good. Red clover is a weed, but it makes amazing honey. Red clover, white clover, there are lots of other um, nectar producing weeds that contribute to making some delicious honey. And I think that's what we see not only in the men and women that we work with and helping to draw the good and the sweet in them, but as a community. And so working with, working with Larry um, to help conceive this building that we've, uh, uh, that we bought, bought a bank <laughs> and it's um, 20,000 square foot bank that he'll share with you later. But I wanted to work with Larry because I knew that he understood the importance of, of a community like North Lawndale having a facility, a campus where people can walk in and feel good and be proud. And so we will have a rooftop apiary in this building, which is going to be fantastic for people. Um, and to help community understand the connection between earth and the planet and food and our ecosystems and and for us, jobs, you know, it's it's really beautiful. Um, and so he was, you know, when we met, I just knew that he was the person that we wanted because, you know, he also understood the importance of the environment and, and green, but also combining that with our urban, understanding the urban um, kind of, of, of importance and energy that we want in our building as well. So he's also helping to draw the good and the sweet out of our community so that people have a beautiful place to learn and to grow and to secure employment. So thank you. So I'll uh, just uh, share with you now uh, some images from the project that's uh, currently under construction and will be open and complete in a month or two. Um, where Brenda's organization is right now is in the original Sears Tower uh, which you, you'll see in this uh, image in the upper left. So that was part of uh, Sears Roebuck's campus. In fact, North Lawndale 
was a huge complex of uh, large companies, Montgomery Ward, Nabisco, Sears, um, and uh, much of the infrastructure is still there, which makes it an extremely uh, strong community to come back. So uh, you'll see the two arrows here, the uh, uh, parcel that Brenda originally bought here that had the bank on it that was built in 1983 over uh, an entire, well, block upon block of, of old city uh, buildings that were demolished during urban renewal. Um, immediately across the street, uh, uh, Sweet Beginnings also purchased an empty lot to establish uh, another apiary. So this is looking down on that one lot uh, where the bank building is number two here. And that's about 10,000 square feet of a footprint. Um, what you'll see is number one, the idea is to create a public outward facing garden at the entry to North Lawndale Employment Network's headquarters. Um, number five, you will see uh, shortly an image of a, what we are calling a peace garden, a walled garden yes. mm -hmm. uh, that uh, will essentially be a, a place where you look uh, solely up to the sky. Um, the a, a rooftop apiary Brenda was mentioning is uh, number four, and that's going to be on top of a drive-through uh, bank uh, teller window. Mm -hmm. um, and then along the bottom of the drawing there, which is on the major commercial road, I will show you an image of our overture to the street. Because originally this building was built as a bank, almost like a fortress, like what you would want your money to be kept in and more a fortress. And now we're turning <laughs> this into a building made for people, right? So we have to sort of invert that, right? And throw our arms open. So um, this is an image of looking at that uh, public facing garden um, that you'll actually enter uh, the building through then you can see that in the distance. Um, this is the overture that's immediately on the busy commercial street. So this will be the cafe. You can think of this as a, just a glassy um, uh, uh, four-sided structure that uh, protrudes from the building and says, you know, reanimates this building. So there was no uh, even large window in this facade before. So we're entirely opening this up. Um, so this is really the overture uh, to the public, which with a, um, sort of a, a design of this honeycomb uh, that uh, suggested by a board member, in fact, that provides some uh, privacy uh, to the people inside, uh, still providing good transparency. So this is a view of that uh, Peace Garden, uh, the image of that, um, where you can actually see the apiary on top of the drive-through in the distance there, right, um, on that second floor. So, uh, and actually part of this Peace Garden is to, is to uh, remember people who died in the violence of North Lawndale, but again, a very peaceful, quiet place. Um, also, you can see some indication of a collaboration with Lincoln Park Zoo, again, highlighting the fact that an ecosystem uh, has no waste and it has no important or less important parts, right? An ecosystem just has parts with every part being as important as any other. So this is a view looking down on the, on the first floor of the building. And remember what I said about the kitchen and inspiration where it was you know, in a very, very prominent place. Well, the same thing occurs here. That number six in the center of this drawing is the workplace. It's, it's where Sweet Beginnings, all the products that Brenda showed you, where they will be uh, processed and packaged will be right in the middle of this building. And, and on three sides, there will be borrowed windows looking into this space from all sides. So as opposed to be putting out back, it's actually in the, it's the center of attention. So off to the left, the number nine on this slide is Wintrust Bank. So this is a community bank, an integral partner uh, with Brenda, um, an integral partner that came in during COVID, the early days of COVID and established over 125 accounts uh, for Brenda's clients um, uh, and, and just an unusually committed uh, uh, local bank here um, that's, that's totally 
in alignment with the mission here. And again, when we talk about people, planet and profit, right, access to capital is a huge barrier and access to banking. Um, and so also number eight is a, a facility part of um, Brenda's program that will be dedicated to financial counseling and having people start uh, establishing credit and so on and so forth. You'll see that the Peace Garden, which is number four on this drawing, is paired with uh, a community room that's labeled number three, immediately adjacent. One of the things that Brenda realized is there's so few places for the community to meet in North Lawndale. And this, which will be named after the alderman's father, um, will be a place where you can have community events on a nightly basis, uh, you know, with a breakout both to uh, the outside private garden as well, access to the cafe and so on. So um, this is very much a public floor um, and, and very much represents this sort of triple bottom line project of responding to people, planet and profit. So this is, uh, these are just views uh, created um, much like Brenda talked about the quality of the food at Inspiration Kitchens, that didn't happen by a mistake. That was intentionally planned to have something um, aspirational, right? Um, something as good as downtown could deliver. So our interiors partner here is an independent designer who, if you look back at, uh, you know, the sort of our versions of Crane's Chicago business, right? the office of the year. They win it year after year after year, right? Incredibly talented and incredibly dedicated to this project too. So it's the idea of de delivering the finest uh, in this place. Um, so uh, again, the aspiration here is very, very high. Although the, the footprint may be humble, the quality is kept very, very high intentionally. This is the entry and the idea is to have that sort of uh, uh, that living sense of the of the natural world, right? Which is a solid strategy for trauma informed design, right? It's all about art and nature. Those two things that can speak to the soul in a way that anything else in your uh, physical environment can't. So the minute you come in, you immediately see something alive uh, in your first view, and that 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 window you can see in the distance in this, in this drawing also looks into uh, sweet beginnings intentionally. The upper floor, I won't spend a lot of time on, but this is a, you know, a balance of administration space, of spaces for the workforce development, meeting with clients, and then uh, learning spaces. The number five there is that apiary that you walk out to that rooftop uh, 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 beekeeping area. This is the corridor, uh, a, a image of the corridor of this. And Martin Luther King lived in 1966, lived in North Lawndale to highlight the housing inequities. And we have gotten, this is clearly a, an image taken uh, from his I Have a Dream speech, but we have three rights to three photographs taken by the Chicago Daily News of his time spent in uh, North Lawndale literally him walking less than two blocks away um, from this building that will be uh, sort of this life-size uh, photo mural that will go the full distance of this second floor corridor. And this is a quick view of the apiary plants across the street, you know, fairly humble sort of a fence screen wall, but with images of uh, of the heroes of the social, right, uh, social rights era, um, actually on the enclosure as well. Yeah. So I know we have about 20 minutes, so I'll go very quickly through this last one because it is a, a aspirational. Uh, it's trying to do, uh, complete that growing. How do I grow at scale, right? To really com complete this food district where I have people preparing food, uh, processing food, right? How do I now grow food at scale? This started out as a project we did for a C40 competition where the arrow is. But before we do this, I know this is not terribly interactive, but the question is, can people guess where this is in the world? This is a place that has over 2000 acres of greenhouses um, that are actively growing. And this is growing and growing and growing. So since this is not interactive, this will have to be, I think, um, honor system. 
Uh, for those who guessed, it must be somewhere like the Netherlands. That's a good guess. I flipped this upside down, but this is 50 minutes from Detroit in Leamington, Ontario. Mm. Mm. So uh, they're at the exact same uh, latitude as Chicago, right? Which uh, they grew in their capacity over four years, um, uh, over 20%, right? So they're just growing in leaps and bounds, uh, literally. So this was our first take on how to do that. It was based on a movement out of Sweden called the Nature House Movement, where you actually built a ship in the bottle, where the bottle was the greenhouse and the ship was the house. And we uh, took that idea and uh, uh, sort of made it into uh, industrial, uh, sort of what I would call urban scale uh, agriculture uh, with housing, uh, but again, aimed at people, planet and profit. Um, this ultimately located in, uh, you know, our proposal is for North Lawndale. What you see in green are vacant lots owned by the city of Chicago. What you see in purple, are restaurants in the city of Chicago. What you see in the big blue dots are the top 50 restaurants as determined by the Chicago Tribune's food critic. So what we look at when we see this is we see a lot of available land within a distance of major Chicago restaurant rows um, in a place that is craving for jobs and opportunity. So that's why we proposed this. And we proposed this to Maurice Cox when he first came to Chicago about a year ago from Detroit. And we said, this is a, uh, an urban scale project that will provide jobs, not for people being imported from other neighborhoods, but for jobs for people in the neighborhoods, right? And would have uh, this sort of follow on effect. Now, by virtue of our, uh, our partner in this, Kevin Augustine, who has been in Chicago real estate now for over 30 years. Um, he connected us with uh, the US's largest owner of uh, these Dutch style greenhouses. And at 20 acres, which seems like a lot to us, he said, look, 20 acres is nothing. I start at 60 acres of glass greenhouses to be able to uh, turn a profit and sell. So we quickly pivoted to this idea of we're not going to grow just food, we're going to grow growers. So what came out of this project is 14 one-story green, uh, 14 one-acre greenhouses that can operate in cooperation and become an incubator for growers, right? That could then take their operations once they establish credit and go to the exurbs, right? Where we'll see uh, larger and larger operations. So as we relocated this to La North Lawndale on these 20 acres, um, you can see the sort of raft style growing, the vine type of growing next to live work units provided for the growers themselves. So these are in the exurbs of Chicago. This, these are greens growing on floating rafts that are floating on a nutrient solution in the far end of the of the greenhouse, they're just planted. As they move towards us in this uh, photograph, um, they're harvested at the other end of the pond. This is Mighty Vine, which is uh, now 22 acres in Chicago uh, uh, exurbs, really, um, growing two different types of tomatoes uh, at scale in Dutch style greenhouses. We did the math on this, quite a bit of this, and the economic modeling. So. Uh, very quickly, this is just a look at the, uh, say, the developer's perspective here of investing uh, $56 million uh, to, for $32 million of annual economic uh, benefits uh, every year, putting 159 of those jobs directly in the greenhouses themselves, in, uh, uh, indirectly creating 48 other jobs and inducing 23 more. So the entire impact of this project would have, would create 2,231 jobs, not for people coming from other neighborhoods, but for people in the neighborhoods. And aspirationally, again, the, the planet part of this is it's conceivable in a hydroponic farm like this to have a completely closed loop, right? A circular economy where you are uh, essentially capturing 
the nutrients, the macronutrients that otherwise would go down the Mississippi and into the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. You actually capture that, you capture your green waste. Um, you can produce uh, combined heat and power. You can capture the CO2 to enrich the growing environment uh, with this because the plants themselves, um, along with 13 mac macro and micronutrients are literally built out of thin air, right? A carbohydrates build, built out of the thin air, right? So this is why uh, agriculture is a primary uh, industry, right? It's the raw materials are, are literally largely for free. So uh, again, leaving 15 minutes for questions, the uh, investor that Kevin Augustine hooked us up with in California, this is the 60 acre project that he talked about in Kentucky. They're gonna build nine more of these. Uh, they did their first harvest uh, last week, in fact. So this, this facility just opened up. Um, this is what it was uh, before the harvest, um, a view of this. Uh, this is in coal country in Kentucky, right? So uh, completely um, remaking the environment. And then a reminder that our, the, really the people who we learn from are the Dutch who feed um, entirely Europe and parts of Africa from a very small country, um, very small footprint, um, but with glass technology that originated in the floral industry, right? Their tulip industry really led to this technology that they've at this point perfected and at least the Canadians are doing at scale across Lake Erie from the United States. So that concludes what we had to prepare and we are happy, Ted, to answer questions at this point. Well, we do have uh, a number of good questions and it just means we'll run over our uh, usual uh, ending time uh, because I wanna get to um, uh, as many, if not all of the questions that we have as possible. But let me turn this over to Professor Basso who has done extensive work on uh, the food economy uh, work and research and teaching. Um, and I'm very curious as to how you respond to this and other efforts to uh, do urban farming. This, this seems to go far beyond uh, uh, gardening. Uh, Chris? Right, I mean, and I'll just offer a few comments so we can get to the questions, but obviously these are, these are, these are great and exciting examples of the way that, you know, we are, you know people are trying to reconnect urban spaces and communities with their food, and food production, you know, in a way, and again, I'm, you know, what's interesting here is that for, for much of the 20th century, thinking about cities did not include thinking about food. It was about, you know, because food came from somewhere else. And the irony is, is that, you know, obviously this neighborhood in Chicago where Nabisco once was headquartered, um, you know, and Chicago, the, the, at one time, the, you know, the meat packer to the world, food jobs went elsewhere because food production went elsewhere. And that, you know, cities became reliant on very long global food chains. I mean, and, you know, you know and so we saw that over the 20th century that the, the divorce between cities and their food supplies, where cities were just, you know, places where food went to from somewhere else and was consumed, was not produced, not processed. Um, it was just delivered and consumed. So I think what's exciting about these efforts is, is their effort to rethink the role of food in cities, um, you know, and also the, to use food to rebuild, in some respects, communities and cities, to create jobs, to create community spaces. Um, so these are exciting opportunities and exciting uh, uh, you know, efforts going on. I mean, there are some in Boston, not to the same scale. Boston's a smaller city. We don't have the land that Chicago has. Um, that's one of the difficulties of some of the uh, of urban agriculture, urban food production kinds of, uh, of constructs. So that means, though, that in places like Boston, where you don't have much vacant land available or land that's affordable vacant land, um, you have to also then include the peri-urban space, um, the, the space outside the central city, where you know a lot, you know, 50, 60, 70 years of land use policies have pretty much led to suburbanization and land and sprawl. And, and especially in places like Chicago, where the great farmland was covered over with, you know, by development. So, I, but you have to reconnect cities and their food supplies. And in the process also, you bring back jobs, you bring back communities because the disinvestment in, in, in food production 
and processing. I mean, the irony is in Boston, we have Commonwealth Kitchen, which is like an incubator operation in, in Dorchester in a former meat processing facility. I mean, so, you know, you, you get, you get uh, people who are trying to reintroduce food back into the city as a way of not just producing food, but also producing jobs, producing connections and communities. Now, the dilemma here, and I'm just going to be very brief, is most of these efforts are by nonprofits or by or using philanthropy because the private market's not going to do this on its own. Um, and so a lot of these things get kickstarted by philanthropy because, you know, again, it's rare, very rare for the private sector to do this. Um, um, and obviously, you know, that's one of the great you know, sticking points of a lot of these efforts. But I think that, you know, as they begin to take traction and people begin to look at these efforts as a way of, again, reconnecting the city to its food supply and to food jobs, these become more and more important. They're small scale. They certainly don't produce much food compared to the global food system, but they're important because they become complementary to the dominant food system. And in some of the cases now of, 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 the, of greenhouses, you know, bring back ironically what used to be very common. You used to have greenhouse districts around cities. You know, so we're ironically, we're almost going backward you know, you know, to what used to be more common prior to the 1950s. Um, but once we became more sort of dependent on mass produced food coming from California, for example, and fruits and vegetables, we no longer decided that greenhouse districts were worth keeping and they were all taken, they were all destroyed. Um, and so I, there is sort of an irony here is that we're almost going back to re thinking regionally and locally about food production, you know, in a way that, you know, it evokes early 20th century, or late 19th century tendencies. So I'll just let it leave a goat there. I mean, I obviously the one, my, 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 there is a lot of irony here, but there's a lot of great work going on here. The scale is small compared to the global food system, um, but it's important because it's bringing back these senses of connection of communities and where their food comes from. And then how food generates jobs, generates community connections and generates a sense of place. I'll leave it at that. So, um... Folks in Chicago have made reference to a food innovation district. Is, is that something that exists in Chicago uh, as a matter of legislation or community action? What is it and, and how did that come into being? Well, we, uh, we really are pushing that um, independently. But if you wanted to look at research, well-researched examples, uh, you could just Google food innovation district in quotes and then Michigan State or MSU. Uh, uh, Michigan has put uh, quite a bit of effort into formalizing research around this and to promoting it. Um, they are a, uh, uh, as a Midwestern state, uh, growing a lot of food that people eat, right? Most of the farms in the Midwest produce uh, animal feed and ethanol and uh, you know, a very small portion, about maybe a quarter to the third are actually produced for food. So Michigan is tilted towards actual uh, uh, food made for, for people to eat. So they are uh, out in front in terms of creating these districts uh, and they have some very good documentation. There are a couple Canadian examples in the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, um, that also are projects that we that we researched and would be uh, full of, of, of good insight. Uh, could, could you go back into uh, what kinds of uh, foundation or public uh, subsidies you received at the outset to get this project going? Did money come from government? Did it all come from private foundations? How did you, how did you get the seed funding to make this happen? Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking, uh, which project are you speaking of, Ted? Well, your first one. Oh, the first one? That's all private money. Uh, I don't believe Inspiration Kitchens uh, had any direct public subsidy. Um, we competed for a grant uh, through an energy foundation here um, and received the grant. We, um, I should also say, overarching all these projects, is a tremendous amount of friction where we have to push against uh, uh, what I would call statically stable, uh, anti-resilient 
uh, city policies and state policies. Uh, it's a huge problem for us in all these projects. Um, and uh, we had to overcome, oh, I don't know how many dispensations we had to get, how many committees and special meetings we had to do to be able to accomplish this project. So I would say, you know, I'm a big fan of the city of Chicago and a lot of its leaders, but at the same time, we have a lot of friction built into our system. So to even install um, energy efficient kitchen hoods, right, that would uh, speed up or slow down depending on the amount of heat being produced. We had to go uh, to extremes here to get uh, those approved uh, for use by the city. So um, there's a number of cases. Uh, it's fairly constant where the, we find the right hand of government fighting the left hand of government, right? So um, I will say that there, from my memory, there weren't any direct public subsidies, no TIF money, um, uh, and, and uh, it was again, privately purchased. So really uh, it was government grants uh, through a, a state foundation. So this is a very interesting form of uh, transit oriented development as well, because uh, these projects are directly adjacent to an elevated subway line. Um, yep. What was the line again and, and uh, how close are the uh, closest stops? What are they? Yeah, so uh, it's just called the conserv uh, conservatory stop or Garfield Park conservatory stop. That's the Inspiration Kitchens project. And then I think it's just known as the Kedzie stop, which is named after a Scottish uh, real estate developer in Chicago, but that's the street that Hatchery is on. So that is the green line in Chicago. The green line goes out to Oak Park where I live um, and then goes to the center of the city and then heads south uh, where it goes uh, through Englewood uh, and then uh, probably it splits at some point, goes to other two other uh, South Chicago neighborhoods. Um, and and at what scale? You you talked about uh, twenty acre sites and sixty acre sites, and of course the the Dutch models, which are larger than that. At what scale do you think uh, this kind of project needs to um, operate at in order to reach a break even point? Yeah, so in our models, uh, it seemed like the sweet spot was uh, somewhere between, I would say, seven to 14 one acres. Uh, we know from our research that doing anything less than one acre is not a commercial scale where you can provide uh, uh, jobs, uh, you know, uh, year round jobs. Uh, you at least need that acre under glass of production space. Um, and so our analysis said that if you combine at least seven to 14 of these, you could drop the costs uh, cooperatively, right? Of the agronomy, the transport, uh, all of the systems uh, to support this, right? The rainwater collection, the CO2 enrichment, all those sorts of things that you could get an economy of scale. And of course we did that by modeling uh, and doing a lot of research with existing operations. So that was our analysis. But unfortunately, uh, like Boston, um, you know, the, the parcels that are this large, right, 20, 20 acres in the city are few and far between. We have a lot of available land in a neighborhood called Pullman, right, which was an old railroad right now. Part of that is a national, uh, literally a national park. Uh, and that is a neighborhood um, with very determined uh, socially minded developers is coming back. So there are a few places in Chicago that have the elbow room to take this scale and Pullman is one of them. Um, what are the kinds of things you've been growing? It appears that um, mostly you're growing a, a small greens and tomatoes. Are, are you aware also of uh, any place that is growing um, larger, taller things, uh, orchards, for example. Yeah, not orchards under glass, but a lot of the vine crops, uh, uh, you know, you can look at uh, what they're growing in the Netherlands right now, or literally in Leamington next to Detroit, where all sorts of vine crops uh, like eggplant, cucumbers, uh, 
uh, uh, bell peppers, what we call bell peppers. Um, tomatoes uh, are, I would say, more difficult for a startup grower to compete with. So um, our, in our estimation, we were also aspiring to do a B and B, a B to B sort of uh, exchange where, uh, much like what's happening in downtown in downtown New York, where a chef will will request that a certain type of produce be grown, and producers will grow that just for them, is that you could develop along with the agronomy experts that we have in Illinois and Purdue and, and other Midwestern places, you could grow uh, new varieties specifically um, designed to grow in a hydroponic environment. Uh, Ohio State has an expert on growing strawberries indoors, right? Which is my dream is to pick strawberries in the middle of winter in Chicago, right? So, so this is, you know, there, uh, this is moving across the world with great rapidity. And there are certainly not all plants and all vegetables that you can grow indoors like this, but a vast variety can be grown, both, I would say, premium products and commodity projects, right? We don't want to grow just premium products that nobody in the neighborhood can afford to eat, right? There has to be diversity, right? Diversity equals resilience. And, and likewise, our intent here would be grow a diverse type of produce uh, and a diff diverse places in the market. And, and speaking of B2B, I will uh, direct my last question to Brenda. <laughs> um, how, how is it that you would see uh, uh, these kinds of beekeeping operations uh, expanding, uh, particularly in urban areas? You know, there's been a lot of discussion about um, uh, diseases that have uh, killed off uh, bee populations outside of cities. Um, and yet uh, uh, you, you're embarking on something here that is fundamental mm -hmm. uh, to the growing chain. So how would, how would you see uh, expanding the kind of work that you've done? So I love this question because it's um, about pollination and how would we pollinate this effort? Um, I think that first of all, beekeeping in the city is far, um, even though we have experienced colony collapse disorder, which is what you're referring to, this weird disappearance of honeybees, but we have found less of that in the city because there's less pesticides that are um, distributed across, unlike the rural areas. So you actually have a cleaner version of urban honey, which is sort of not intuitive at first thought. You would think that an urban brand of honey would might be, you know, you think of, you know, pollution or what have you, but it's actually cleaner and better. Mm -hmm. And so what we what we want is just for people to even think about having one hive in their backyard. Um, and they can produce their own honey, but they can also um, you know, sell it on the side of the road if they wanted to do something like that. But it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be at the scale that we're doing. We're also encouraging people just to plant um, native bee-friendly um, plants so that we can take care of our, of our bees in that way. But in terms of scaling in a larger way, you know, we are interested in um, further codifying our model at Sweet Beginning so that there are communities that are similar to ours where we're actually creating an economic engine. Um, a good example of that is we've been approached and the timing wasn't good for us, but like by a couple of Native American reservations where young people need some kind of work and that they could have their own brand of honey, create sweet beginnings. I mean, that's where you're, you're creating an economic engine there. We've also looked at um, a few other uh, departments of corrections, uh, California is one, where people have asked if we would be willing to sort of start an apiary. Male you know, prisons have a lot of land and we could help folks get skills and work with them prior to their departure. So there, there is room for scale um, around bees and pollination. Um, but I think that, you know, because we started off as a mission driven focus, getting to a, we're sustainable, but certainly probably not in terms of commercial profitability, you know. Um, and for us, 
we the, the the triple bottom line also has to do with people not going back to prison and the and so there are these social returns on the investment that we're making on individuals like this that um make a good case a business case but not a traditional one right so so anyway but we are interested in in pollinating the model a place to do that now it's very possible to scale at a larger level if that's what we want to do or if that's where there's interest but we also appreciate small individual efforts um, like i've mentioned well so being at one with urban ecology and with social justice yeah uh this this has been a fascinating presentation um the this session uh as is the case with all of our sessions has been recorded and will be archived and uh, will be available um, on the School of Public Policy and uh, Dukakis Center website as a part of uh, Northeastern's offerings to the public. Uh, let me uh, turn this back over to Anne-Marie to talk about uh, next week's presentation and to offer any final, final comments that, that you may have. Anne-Marie? Hey, thank you, Ted, and thank you, Brenda and Larry and Christopher for joining us tonight. This was, uh, as so many people have commented, very inspiring. Um, as with all of our sessions uh, on our Rudy Bruner Award website, we'll be posting a page that includes resources, including a link to the case study for Inspiration Kitchens, as well as other resources that have been mentioned during the, the presentation. Uh, as Larry mentioned, our Rudy Bruner Award website includes uh, links, includes case studies for over for the 88 projects that have been awarded over the more than 30 years of the Rudy Bruner Award. So we encourage you to check that out if you're interested in learning more. And I did mention that one of our uh, winners, uh, Via Verde in Bronx, New York, does is a housing project that includes a rooftop orchard. So wow. there, there, are, there are many other, uh, actually we have within our portfolio of winners, many projects that involve public markets as well. I recognize somebody attending who's been work, who's worked on a couple of those projects. Uh, next week, we'll travel to Memphis and we will uh, spend time with um, Crosstown Concourse, our 2019 gold medalist to learn about how the inclusion of an innovative public high school promotes real world learning, collaboration, exchange, and community building. So wow. I will hope you hope you can join us for that and keep an eye out. Uh, we'll be posting uh, more of our upcoming sessions in, in the coming week or two. So I'll turn this back to Ted. Well, thank you all for uh, coming tonight. Uh, you'll find uh, the next week's session on designing learning environments and schools uh, to be, I think, uh, quite fascinating. Uh, this has been the open classroom from Northeastern University, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for joining.